Welcome. We owe a great debt to our military service members. Today we'll find out who they are in debt to. An investigative reporter from ProPublica will explain just how thousands of soldiers go broke. Then in our public intellectual segment where we look at new research with the power to change our minds and public policy, two recent deaths and a viral video raise questions about bicycle safety. Two scientists who study bike safety will join us. And Ashkenazi Jews, it turns out, descend from a tiny group of ancestors. We'll see why this factoid might help in the battle against cancer for everyone. And from bagels to checkered cabs, New York City in 101 objects. But first, a series of investigative stories on the website ProPublica reveal how some discount stores near military bases offer service members financing for personal goods, then sue them for falling behind on payments. Once the companies win in court, they can seize the wages of the service members. ProPublica reporter Paul Keel brought all this to light. His initial story, thank you for your service, how one company sues soldiers worldwide, also appeared in the Washington Post this summer. Paul covers consumer finance for this independent investigative reporting team, ProPublica, and authored The Great American Foreclosure Story in 2012. He joins us now. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, so how does this work? Are there certain kinds of discount stores near uh, military bases? Uh, well, this one is uh, the, the biggest, I believe, about 30 locations uh, nationwide. They're outside of the, large, the 11 largest bases in the country. Um, but it's really their specialty. And there's uh, other businesses like this. There's a, a handful. That this actually, meaning service members are their customers right. or setting up for wage garnishment? Well, <laughs> that's, that's obviously not the way they advertise themselves. But uh, specifically service members. I mean, they're right outside the base, and they advertise in base newspapers, on the radio, um, and the message is basically, if you're drawing a paycheck from the military, guaranteed you're going to get credit from us. That's everything. Every ad says that. Credit, credit, credit. Credit, credit, credit. And you what walk in. What kinds of things do they sell primarily? Right. So you walk in and it's kind of like a shrunk down Best Buy. Uh, they have appliances, electronics. Uh, there's you know bedroom sets and stuff like that. Um, so it's kind of like everything in one that you'd need to, for instance, fill up your first home. Um, which is how you know a lot of soldiers end up using it. So do they give credit to people who don't deserve credit? Is that why a lot wind up falling behind on the payments? Well, it, so I mean, it's good to keep in mind who goes in there. So soldiers often are quite young, um, so they can you know be 19, 20 years old. Uh, and the reason they don't have good credit is because they don't have any credit history, right? Um, and this is one way you know the company would say that they can build their credit up. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, soldiers are often stretched financially. Uh, they might be, uh, you know, raising a family on a relatively tight, you know, budget, uh, and you know, little emergencies come up, so people do fall behind. Can you tell us a story of somebody, an individual who you profiled, and what the pattern of purchases and credit problems was? Sure. So we talk about one uh, soldier who uh, he had already been deployed once, and he's being deployed to Iraq, and he needed a laptop. So he went in the store and got a laptop. Uh, you know, he had a, a little bit of a checkered uh, credit history, but he just needed a laptop, so he walked in. He ended up picking a laptop. This is back in 2009. Um, that should have retailed for about $600. Uh, but... The reason that they offer credit to everyone, at least one reason, is it's very high price, but the price isn't always evident. So one reason is the, the items are quite marked up. Um, and oh, wait, didn't you call this a discount store? Right. So their USA Discounters is the name of the store. Uh, but every item I looked at uh, had a markup, you know, at least 50 percent, sometimes more than 100 percent. Um, it's, that's regular. From so that's what? Great. From the store's wholesale from, price or compared what you, to what you would pay at a real right. Best Buy, let's exactly. say? Exactly, yeah. Um, and what the company said is that, well, we're not a big national retailer like Best Buy, so we can't offer competitive prices. But it's not just a little bit. It's quite a bit above um, what you would get like in a real discount store. Um, on and top I guess the military bases in many cases are in somewhat rural locations, out of the way. Right. And, you, the, you know, the normal shopping malls aren't maybe so accessible, so they're, um, not to say captive audience, but it's a lot easier for the service members to shop at these places? Right. It's right. I mean, some of them are literally, like, less than a mile over a mile from the base. Um, they're right there. And what we heard from credit counselors who work on bases is that 
even though they often try to warn soldiers away from places like this, uh, you know, they have red, white, and blue coloring, they have bunting, they have the big flag, they have an eagle, you know, and it, it just seems like they're, they're friendly, you know, they're military friendly and that's how they advertise themselves, so it can, that can be persuasive in its own right. Um, so but to go back to our example of our soldier on his way to Iraq, um, so on top of the overpriced item, there's usually 20 to 30 percent interest. And then on top of that, there's these extra add-on products. 20 to 30 percent interest. Interest rate, right. 20 to 30 percent interest. Right. That doesn't violate usury laws. Do we have usury laws anymore? No. Well, I mean, in this day and age, uh, you know, that's, that's what a subprime credit card is. So it's compared to things like payday loans and, you know, they, it's, <laughs> the, the, the landscape has changed what people would think of as, as a reasonable interest rate. Um, but making this further more expensive is these add-on products that gives a very expensive warranty they put on these things. So f to take this example, you have a $600 laptop. It turns into a $2,000 loan um, that the guy's going to be paying back over two years. And so in this example, he ended up having issues with his, you know, mother had medical expenses and that kind of tipped him over the edge. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is these are very expensive loans for the items that these soldiers are, are taking out. In their statement to your initial article, USA Discounters said, quote, only a handful of military customers, unquote, defaulted on payments, and they only seized wages uh, less than 1% of the time for military customers. Is that a true statement? Uh, I think it's artfully constructed, and I don't want to get into like a, a litigation. I mean, so we found that they sued over 13,000 individuals in, this, this, in the court where they sue people over these debts. So that's obviously, it's a large number of people. I mean, they, they do make a lot of loans, but uh, it seemed to us that it was essentially part of their, their business model that not only do they look for customers who are like soldiers of a guaranteed paycheck, but they know they have this step that they can take if they fall behind that they can take the money involuntarily. And when you say it's part of the business model, is that to say their threshold for creditworthiness is lower than some other businesses because they, they know they're going to do this and they're going to make more money on this than if they didn't lend to people who did not have as bad credit? Am I making sense? Right. I mean, the business model, if you think about it, is we'll take, we'll take on all comers um, as long as they have you know, a government paycheck. And then part of the business model is you overprice stuff, you add on all these other things, you make the loans expensive, um, and then you make sure that you have a way to collect if things go bad. So where have I heard this story before? Oh yeah, you wrote the great American foreclosure story <laughs> in 2012, and that right. was all about, I guess because the banks could um, securitize their mortgages and get rid of the risk, they were giving mortgage loans to all kinds of people who really were pretty bad credit risks, and ultimately to the disadvantage of those homeowner borrowers, because they're the ones who wound up getting foreclosed upon. Right. I mean, it is similar. Like, I mean, one aspect of subprime lending that people don't like to think about is often very aggressive collection tactics. Right. On that, on that. So, is it legal? Uh, well, in this case, I think it's questionably legal, this one company. And the reason for that is uh, they're based in Virginia. The Hampton Roads area in southeast Virginia has an enormous military population. That's why these types of places sometimes come from there. Um, and it's very convenient for them to sue in their local court. So that's what they do, regardless of whether a soldier happened to walk into a store in Texas. Maybe the soldier's now in Germany. The lawsuit still happens in Virginia. And the reason they say they can do that is because they put a clause in their contracts that says, we can sue you in Virginia. It's like, you know, the contract has a lot of stuff in it. There's a lot of clauses. It is right there. Um, and often they require people to sign, sign next to it. Um, but that's part of, I mean, I think that's, arguably part of their business model is cheaply suing people. They just walk down to their local court and right. they can sue people, soldiers who are based anywhere in the world. And that happens to be a case where it's such a shame. By coincidence, I used to live in Norfolk, Virginia, working at a news organization there. Mm -hmm. And I'm familiar with the Norfolk Naval, ba Norfolk Naval Base and the huge military population there and some of the others. And that's a city. It is really easy uh, for those sailors to get off the base and go to one of, you know, a half a dozen major shopping malls uh, where they may not be subject to this that's really, really close. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's part of it is they, you know, they portray themselves as military friendly. And there might be, an, you know, a case where you think, well, I, I can't 
I'm not, no one's going to give me a credit card because I don't have a credit history or maybe I have a, a you know a checkered past. Um, so you know, sometimes the, the soldiers will seek them out. Um, but uh, I mean, to get back to the questionable legal aspect of yes. this, so they they sue in this Virginia court. Um, the Virginia judges told us, you know, the law says as long as the contract says they can do this, they can do this. You know, the fact that if you're a soldier in Texas and you'd have to buy a plane ticket to go defend yourself in court, that's not a defense, the fact that you can't afford to show up. Um, but under federal law, arguably, it's so unfair that there are laws that protect consumers in that way. So um, after the story ran, we did see some response from senators in Congress, and they wrote letters to both the Department of Defense and federal regulators who the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau saying you should investigate this. And that is definitely one thing they would look at is to see whether that is so unfair that it is actually illegal. And that's where it stands right now. Right. We don't know if there's an investigation ongoing. We know that senators have asked. And the example soldier that you were mm -hmm. telling us the story of before, um, was he actually in Iraq, like in combat, at he, the time they were trying to At the time elect? they sued him, he was in Germany which is often where soldiers, you know, are held between right. deployments. So. so this is a particularly sympathetic population. Everybody, right. you know, wants to support our service members who are putting their lives on the line. So if they're being ripped off, uh, if it is deemed to be a rip off, then people will get outraged. As you say, members of Congress and the DOD um, have gotten into the act. Does the same kind of thing go on in the civilian population in the same kind of way? Uh, this exact thing where you're suing someone in this one court, I mean, the one example I've seen of that is Pay the Lender, who was doing that. It was, uh, it was affiliated with an Indian tribe in South Dakota, and they were suing people in South Dakota. Um, but that so, sounds obscure. Right. But I just mean like discount, so-called discount stores right. um, that offer easier credit to people with maybe bad credit mm -hmm. or no credit. Sure that other stores won't lend credit to, mm -hmm. and it's part of their business model too. And maybe they're set up in other places that are located to sweep people in, maybe mm -hmm. in low income urban neighborhoods, right. maybe in I don't know what. Yeah, um, I would say the, the example that I've done some reporting on is, is high cost lenders like payday lenders, um, and that they do make loans to just about anyone right. as long as you make a very, very basic criteria. And, and those and, are pure and, lenders, right. that's a little different than these stores where they're right. selling you the things right. and you get take out a loan to buy the things. Right. Um, but I mean, it's a thing where people are you know, living paycheck to paycheck and there's this right. promise of, and I've seen those lenders sue in very large numbers as well. Yeah. So, And where does wage garnishment come into it? Uh, wage garnishment, so once they sue you in court, that gives a creditor pretty significant powers. So they can either uh, go after your wages from your employer and take up to a quarter of that, or they can even go to your bank account and sweep that out. They can sweep money out of your bank account. They can take up to a quarter of your wages mm -hmm. to pay back your laptop loan or whatever it is. Sure. Yeah. Um, so is there something that needs to be done at a policy level? Does ProPublica go that far as to recommend that or to list options that may be out there that people would consider? Well, I mean, with regard to consumer issues, there actually is a, a federal cop on the beat in the way there really hasn't been, and that's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which came out of the financial crisis. It's a new entity. And so, it's for the thing that Elizabeth Warren wanted right, so badly so right. that the banks fought and fought and fought that they hated with a passion, but it's in there. It's, in, it's doing, and it's, it's been pretty active in enforcement matters. So things like this where it, you, know, you might re need to rely on, for instance, state attorneys general to do something about it on a state-by-state -state basis. Now there's actually a federal cop on the beat who uh, has you know, had some significant enforcement issues. So, and they're also um, rewriting our federal debt collection practices rules. So that could lead, for instance, in this example, uh, to new rules that would basically make this illegal up front. So this fits how into wage garnishment generally? Um, the, 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 the soldier story? Yeah, or, yeah soldier I mean, it's story. an example of, of uh, well, step back. So I've been you know, reporting on consumer finance issues for a while, and it's just always struck me that there's no numbers on how common this is. And even though this does, it goes through a, a local court, which is a public record, um, it's oddly kind of hidden. 
Um, so uh, one thing we did is we recently uh, asked ADP, which is this major payroll services company, to do a study because there's this gap. There's no, net, there's no one had any idea, for instance, how many people have their wages garnished. So um, we did that story with NPR a couple weeks ago, and the main number I think that comes out of it is uh, an estimate of 4 million people who had their wages garnishment over consumer debt in 2013, which I think is far more than people appreciated. And, and the people who were hit by this, people earning less than $40,000 a year, where they had the, by far the highest rates, uh, Midwest had higher rates, you know, blue collar workers. Um, so it's something that actually is a major part of people's lives that I don't think has really been appreciated. And we just have a minute left. Sure. But people might ask, isn't this the responsibility of the borrower? Nobody is forcing them to borrow money they enter into a contract willingly, and then if you do borrow money from somebody, you are responsible to pay it back. Mm -hmm. And if you're failing to pay it back, then maybe they should have the right to garnish your wages. So why not throw this back on the individual? Um, well, I mean, you can, but you could also look at it in a larger scope. So for instance, I see, if I see a company that is relying very heavily on suing people to, as part of their business, that's obviously a problem. And then also, the other thing we're looking at more broadly is um, the laws around all this stuff have been basically been the same on the federal level since the late 1960s, and the world has changed, and so that's one thing I think people need to look at. Paul Keel from ProPublica, thanks for lifting the veil on this. Thanks. Up next, bikes and pedestrians. Can't we all just get along? Time for Public Intellectual, where we look at research with the power to change our minds and public policy. This past week, Jill Tarlov, a 58-year-old mother, died from injuries sustained after a bicycle hit her in Central Park. In early August, Irving Schachter, a 75-year-old teacher, lost his life after being hit by a bike while trading for the New York Marathon, also in Central Park. Both accidents occurred in broad daylight. The deaths come at a time when car pedestrian and bike safety are high on City Hall's agenda. How big is the problem? And are we on the right path towards solving it? You may be surprised how much we are. Here to share their research into this are CUNY professors Peter Tuggle from the Department of Sociology at Hunter College and William Milsarski, Associate Professor in the Department of Urban Affairs and Planning at Hunter College. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. What data set were you looking at? My colleague and I examined uh, patient records for all hospitals in New York City, in New York State, and in uh, California. We also conducted uh, two observational studies um, in which we observed the riding behavior of uh, cyclists. So based on these two uh, data sets, we uh, derived a number of conclusions about riding behavior of cyclists in, uh, in New York City and New York State. So for example, on the hospital records, um, what did you see and how can you relate it specifically to what's happening with bikes? Okay. Um, we found initially that in uh, the period 2004 to 2008, um, there was a, an increase in the number of um, collisions between uh, cyclists and pedestrians. But very importantly, since 2008, for the last four years, there's been a downward trend in the number of injuries sustained by pedestrians due to collisions with cyclists. Um, this is uh, very important to note. Uh, obviously, these uh, two accidents that occurred in uh, Central Park in the last two months were tragedies. But I think it's very, very important not to draw unwarranted inferences from these two accidents because the data that we have observed shows that there's now been a downward decline in number of accidents uh, to pedestrians caused by cyclists. And this is despite an, in, an upsurge in the number of cyclists uh, in New York City. Or maybe because of the upsurge in the number of bicyclists in New York City. Do you think that's possible? There seems to be some evidence from our observational studies where we had our students out in the streets uh, observing the behavior of cyclists that there is more law-abiding behavior, more of a tendency to stop at red lights, more of a tendency to use the bike lanes, more of a tendency to wear helmets. Uh, 
we don't know this for sure, but we think that the introduction of city bike has something to do with this, and we think that the extensive improvements to the bike infrastructure have something to do with this. Right. Uh, city bike by design is a heavy, clunky bike that's built for comfort, not built for speed. Probably less likely to get into an accident with a pedestrian or another car for that matter on that kind of vehicle, right? I, that's, that's true, and my own view on this, having used the system in Paris, but not the one here in New York yet, is that you tend to be more cautious. You're riding a strange bike, for the tourist at least, in a strange city, or for people who don't regularly use bicycles, it's their first time maybe in a while, so they tend to be quite cautious, and I think that's contributing to a general air of safety. What did you want to add? I, I just wanted to add that, in fact, uh, former controller John Liu famously said uh, that uh, city bikes have three speeds, slow, very slow, and <laughs> ultra slow. <laughs> right, um, and of course that's just, just city bikes. Right. There's an explosion in the number of private bikes um, that are also being used for commuting in the city. How, what, can you put some specific numbers on this trend of um, you know, less accidents, fewer accidents since 2008? Uh, stopping at red lights. Off the top of my head, this is more behavior uh, than, yes, than right. Accidents. Several years ago, when we did a similar study, uh, we we set, found I think about 50 percent of people going through red lights. That's down to about 30 percent now. I'd have to look at the paper. Of course, to could be you imagine if 30 percent of drivers were going through red lights? Right. Um, does infrastructure have something to do with this? Yeah, there are a number of reasons why we suspect there's been a downward trend in the number of uh, accidents to pedestrians caused by cyclists. Uh, one factor is certainly an improvement in the cycling infrastructure. And there have been a, a limited number of studies that have shown, for example, that when you install a bike lane in a certain area, uh, that tends to promote uh, road safety, not just for the cyclists, but also for pedestrians. Um, another factor which is, uh, we feel critically important in trying to understand why there's been this spiraling downward in the number of accidents is because the age composition of individuals who have been injured, um, pedestrians who have been injured by cyclists has changed dramatically in the last 10, 15 years. Gotten older? Um, yes. Uh, the most vulnerable group uh, of individuals, of pedestrians who are injured by cyclists tend to be the young, those who are 14 years of age or, or younger. But what's happened is that the proportion of, of, of victims in these accidents who are in that age group has dramatically decreased. For example, um, in the period 2004 to 2006, if you look, for example, at outpatients in New York City, roughly half of the victims, half of the pedestrians who were struck by cyclists were 14 years of age or younger. In the year 2012, that figure went from 50% down to 33%. Why? Um, very good question. Um, we, we believe that one reason is that there are far fewer school-aged children walking or riding to school. For example, in 1969, the figure was, I believe, roughly 40, 45 percent of school-aged children were either walking or riding their bikes to school. Now, uh, or at least in the last few years, the figure has plummeted to about uh, 13 percent. So one reason is that you have far fewer children walking or riding their bikes to school. Uh, another reason is that children tend to be much more sequestered. They're no longer playing outside as much as they used to. They're no longer playing in the streets. Uh, they're playing much more indoors. If we had to hypothesize, uh, it may very well be the case that they're more uh, preoccupied playing video games yeah. on their computers. So it's not that fewer older people are getting hurt. I mean, it's not that more older people are getting hurt. It's that fewer kids are getting hurt. That's one of the main reasons that fewer children are getting hurt, and that's, uh, the, as I say, the age composition of the, of the victims has changed dramatically in the last 10, 15 years. Right. Although last year, William, I'm looking at numbers from the Department of mm -hmm. Transportation of the city, and it says the number of pedestrian bicycle collisions reported jumped to 309 from 243 the year before. Does this uh, counter your uh, other observations? Well, there, there's, there's two things to say about that. One, uh, two data points don't make a trend. Let's see what the statewide data shows us at the end of this year and in years going forward. But we don't trust that number either. That's based on police reports 
Uh, and in fact, the emergency room data that we use shows that the numbers for 2012 was actually higher than that, but still lower than it had been in previous years. Uh, could it be that the police are getting involved in more minor pedestrian bicycle accidents where maybe no one's hurt, I don't know, but it's every, on everybody's mind now in a different way, or why else? Well, we, we think, excuse me, just, sure. just the opposite, that a police report isn't filed unless somebody who's involved in the accident calls the police. Correct. So I might be hit by a cyclist and I don't have the presence of mind or I just don't care to get the police involved, but I still wind up going to the emergency room. And so this is not uncommon to see emergency room numbers higher than police reports. If I, go ahead. If I may just interject a note, uh, and we have more faith in, in the uh, hospital records because it covers a large universe. Um, and in, parenthetically, uh, the same finding also is revealed with respect to uh, uh, data concerning assaults. Hospital records show much more uh, assaults occurring than do police reports. Huh. So we have more faith in our data uh, than, uh, than the data uh, gathered by the DOT. That's interesting. And if there are fewer accidents while there are more bikes, you know, the former Transportation Commissioner, Jeanette Sada Khan, once said to me, I'm sure she said in many places, that one of the reasons for city bike, one of the reasons for more bikes is in pursuit of traffic calming as she calls it, which is to, in general, if there are more bikes on the streets, it's going to make the cars go slower and also discourage them from, from even being there, uh, but make the cars go slower. So there may be fewer car pedestrian accidents as a result of additional bicycles on the street. I don't know if you've measured that. That's something that's on our agenda for the future to look <laughs> yes. into that, what's happening between cars, and especially in the light of Vision Zero. I think it's important to have reliable data on what's happening on the number of accidents and injuries to pedestrians involved in accidents with motor vehicles. And Central Park, where these two horrific accidents took place, uh, is also a very unusual spot. It's not out in traffic. It's a place where racing bikes do go to ride the ring road and probably think they're more immune from the normal um, hazards of traffic than they may be, um, you know, especially if they're going in the car lanes where the speed limit is a car speed limit and they may think that it's uh, safe for them to go that fast. And it's not just bicycles and pedestrians running into each other, it's also bicycles running into car doors. And I want to show a little bit of a video that has gone viral online in recent weeks. Uh, this is, uh, I'll tell you in advance, spoiler alert, the guy is okay. His name is Dan Connor, but this is from a helmet's eye view. He actually has a little camera in his bicycle helmet, and uh, you will see him, well, let's watch. Look out. open the door into me in the bike lane and that's why I don't ride in bike lanes and as I said that guy at least according to himself by the end of that video later on says he's okay no serious injury appeared to have taken place uh, but that's a scary thing and that's part of the mix of what do we put where and he said that's why I don't like to ride in bike lanes because bike lanes, though they seem sequestered from traffic, yes, they are shared space with car doors um, opening. So do you propose solutions coming out of your research to make things safer for everybody? Specifically with regard to dooring, uh, there's, there's several things I've looked into which are sort of low cost fixes. Um, you've heard this before. I've heard people on your show talk about education enforcement and engineering is the three E's. So there's the education component here. If we could teach drivers 
to reach for their car door by reaching across themselves, so it forces them to look backwards. That's one very minor fix. Putting a sticker on the side view mirror where it's allowed by law, the law might have to be changed, that says, look for traffic behind you. In cabs, now this was a cab, in Boston and Chicago, they have big signs in the back of the cab, look for traffic before you open the door. As far as the engineering aspect, that was an interesting bike lane. It was an unprotected bike lane adjacent to cars, and then there was a little buffer, about a foot wide, between the bike lane and the traffic. Painted striped yes. lines. That buffer could have also been on the other side near the cars. So there's a little more room between where the cars are and where the bike lane is. And bicyclists have to be trained to ride near the outer edge of the bike lane to avoid being doored. And of course, from an engineering point of view, more protected bike lanes is probably the, the, the best engineering solution to what's going on there. Anything to add? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, with respect to um, cyclists, um, it doesn't just pertain to cyclists, it pertains to motorists as well. There's got to be stricter enforcement of uh, existing traffic laws. And it can't be just sporadic. Uh, this past uh, August, under the de Blasio administration, uh, there uh, occurred Operation Safe Cycle, in which they ticketed uh, cyclists, but it only endured for uh, two weeks. You can't just do it on a sporadic basis. It's got to be done regularly. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think consideration's got to be given to lowering the speed limit of, uh, of cyclists. In Central Park, it's, I believe, 25 miles per hour. That's a pretty pa a fast pace to, to, to be riding a bike in an area where you have a concentration of pedestrians, cyclists, uh, kids on skateboards, motorists. Um, so 25 miles an hour, is that the speed limit for the cars on the Ring Road of Central Park? I believe that's... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or is there such a thing as a bicycle-specific speed limit? I, 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 read, I, I believe, believe just that, today. I believe that there is. It's 25 in Central Park. In Central Park. Um, so we would be in favor of lowering the speed limit for cyclists, just as we are in favor, obviously, of uh, lowering the speed limit for, for cars. Um, 25 is pretty fast on a bike. 25 is pretty is, fast. Right? In fact, and, but the, those racers were going, could be going faster than 25? Uh, there was an article in today's Times that, that where people clock their speed limits and sometimes they're as high as 35 miles an uh. hour uh, cycling in Central Park. And if, if cyclists want to race, I mean, first of all, uh, they should consider, if they're going to use Central Park or any other park, they should consider being in the park before eight o'clock in the morning, because after after that time period, there's a lot of people out there, and uh, that's just going to increase the likelihood of an accident. Or perhaps it should be considered that there not be uh, speed cycling in any of the parks. That perhaps the, there could be a designated area, such as the Palisades or some other area, uh, where you could have uh, cyclists engaging in uh, riding their bikes on a uh, at a fast clip, right. but not in Central Park. Can't we all get along on the streets and the roads of New York City? Progress toward understanding it and coming up with possible solutions from our guests. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank pleasure. You. If you were at a Rosh Hashanah dinner last week, maybe there were jokes about how much family members have in common. This is no joke. A new study finds that the largest subset of the Jewish population called Ashkenazi Jews, who happen to include me, descended from just 350 people a thousand years ago. Put another way, one could say that Natalie Portman and Albert Einstein are pretty likely 30th cousins or so. Why were scientists studying these Jewish genes? The findings could advance medical science in fighting diseases such as breast cancer and others for society at large. A raft of researchers from Columbia, Yale, Einstein College of Medicine, and other institutions contributed to the report. Here to represent the research, Todd Lenz, director of the Laboratory of Analytic Genomics at the Long Island Jewish North Shore Hospital. He co-founded the Ashkenazi Genome Consortium. And thank you very much for joining us. What was the purpose originally of this Jewish genome study? Right, well, the main purpose is, as you mentioned, a whole group of researchers from a lot of different institutions and medical schools, both here in New York as well as in Israel, uh, for a long time have been aware of the fact that the Jewish population is unique in their genetic background, specifically because we had such a small founding population 
there's a lot more similarities between one uh, Ashkenazi Jewish person to another to another. And that really allows us to see more clearly what genes might be involved in specific diseases. In other words, the, the human genome is so complex, and you and I and everybody else, we're all unique, as we like to say. But amongst Jewish people, such as you and me together, um, there's so much more similarity that if one of us had a particular disease, such as cancer, that difference would be able to come out from the background more readily. So, cousin, I'm assuming. <laughs> yes, um, all of us. There would be information from that database yeah. that could then be generalized to other people who are not in this Ashkenazi Jewish descendant subset, uh, but might have a similar gene or gene pattern that could be identified as a result of what you learned from the smaller group? A great example of that is uh, with the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer that many people in your audience are probably familiar with. Um, the genetic variant, the mutations in that gene that are uh, related to breast cancer happen to be of much uh, greater prevalence in the Jewish population, but other variations that are found in other populations uh, may also contribute to breast cancer. So for example, Angelina Jolie, who has a variation, is not Jewish. Um, she's from a French-Canadian background, and that is where she inherited her BRCA1 gene. So yes, things that we find in the Ashkenazi genome are broadly applicable, but just might be easier to research in the Ashkenazi population. How did you arrive at this tiny number, the 350 original Ashkenazi Jews? Yeah, um, well, it's sort of an extended version of looking at a family history or a family tree. So if you look at um, children or two siblings, let's say, they will share a large percentage of their genomes in common because they're inheriting them from the same mother and father. Uh, so two siblings on average would share about 50% of their DNA. Uh, for um, people who are first cousins and have the same grandparents, it, it will be a proportionally less and less and less. Um, when you get into the broad general population, there's very little sharing um, that would be found like relatives, but when you quantify very precisely and with some of the newest technologies of whole genome sequencing that we were able to employ, you're able to precisely quantify the level of similarity between any two Ashkenazi Jewish individuals. And then you can use some fancy mathematics to uh, compute how many great-great-great-grandparents in common they must have had. So what is it that happened a thousand years ago? And what would have happened to other Jewish groups right. that presumably existed at the time? Um, well, of course, uh, the history of the Jews um, has been one of being persecuted and, and expelled. And around that time, around 1000 AD, and in the centuries around that period, um, there were a number of great expulsions and pogroms and massacres of various Jewish populations in Europe. And one group of Jews who found themselves moving eastward into what we now call Eastern Europe, but in that time was the western part of the Russian Empire, Poland and the Ukraine and so on, um, those communities actually had a period of many centuries in a row, almost unique in Jewish history, of not being massacred and persecuted and actually being able to prosper. So those communities were able to have many children, and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and so on, leading down to us today. So that that population of 350 now uh, has its descendants number around 10 million worldwide. Basically, all the European Jews came originally from the Middle East, right? Yes, that's right. And that goes back to the diaspora um, in the Roman times. Um, and from there, the Jews spread out throughout different parts of Europe as well as the Middle East. And it wasn't simply that there were only 350 Jews around in Europe at that time. It's just that those were the Jews who happened to move to certain areas where they were able to prosper, reproduce, and have many, many descendants. Are there any other genomic studies that identify such small numbers uh, but concentrated among individual groups there to are. which we can go back in history and, and Yes, learn? there are, and, and probably the most famous and the most well studied is the Icelandic population. A company called Decode Genetics uh, was founded a couple of decades ago to very comprehensively assess the Icelandic population, which has been quite isolated in its history. They have a bit of a difference in that they did not have an explosive expansion into the number of millions uh, from such a small early population. But people have also studied the Amish 
and other small isolated groups, Sardinians, for example. But the Ashkenazis are somewhat unique in that they're such a large population today. And so you're able to, from a medical research perspective, find many patients with cancer or schizophrenia or diabetes, the various diseases that we're interested in studying in our consortium. Would there be a higher incidence of disease or genetic disorders in general because the group going way back was relatively inbred? Not in general. There are certain well-known Ashkenazi diseases that are related to uh, our history, such as Tay-Sachs disease and some others where um, you need to have two copies. They're called recessive disorders. But um, those The mother been, and the father both have yes, to have the Yes, where the mother and the father are both carriers of the gene, and if you are unlucky enough that they each are passing that gene variant onto the offspring, then that offspring would have two copies and become a patient with that disease. But we're talking here about very common diseases that are found equally amongst Jewish people as amongst the general population. Cancer, um, schizophrenia, as I said, all the, the more regular day-to-day, -day, what we call common complex diseases. Why were so many institutions involved in this one study? Yale, Columbia, Einstein, etc.? Yes. Um, well, that was because there were so many groups of genetics researchers, each with their own specific focus originally. So my group was originally interested in mental illness like schizophrenia and bipolar. Another group might have been Parkinson's disorder or, and so on and so on. But we all realized we were doing the same type of research with the same goals in mind and that if we pooled resources and, and shared our data, we would be able to make progress that much more quickly. So might this study move the entire field of genome mapping forward? That's our hope, because the field of genome mapping has been one of great promise and at times great disappointment because of the complexity, because we are all so different from each other, because there are six billion, literally, letters or nucleotides in the human genome. So that complexity and every new technology that we develop uh, brings forth a new vista of more complexity and more dizzying differences between people. So we try to focus on the commonalities, and that's what we've been able to do in our study. Interesting work. Thanks a lot. Thank you. From the Tencent Cent subway token to the Levittown house, our next guest has painstakingly compiled a list of 101 physical items that he thinks tell the story of New York. Behind each object is a story and a memory for many of you. So let's look at some of these objects. Joining us, none other than the New York Times urban affairs correspondent and author of A History of New York in 101 Objects, Sam Roberts. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, Brian. And let's ju jump right into an image of the first object, and then we'll back up and ask you what the heck you're doing here in general. So let's put this on the screen, and it looks like some kind of a birth certificate. It is indeed a birth certificate from 1626. It is called the Schahagen Brief. It took me a long time to learn how to pronounce that. Sure it is. But it is the, uh, it is the bill of sale, in effect, for Manhattan Island. It was reported to the Dutch West India Company on a ship returning to Amsterdam, and it said, uh, we uh, brought back a bunch of otter skins and beaver skins. There were some births that uh, uh, happened in New Amsterdam, and by the way, we bought Manhattan Island from the Indians. Now, it's arguable whether the Indians thought it was the sale of Manhattan Island, but the Dutch assumed it was, and that is what the closest thing to New York's birth certificate that exists. This is incredible. So euphemistically, it's a birth certificate, but when we all learn in elementary school that um, the Indian sold Manhattan for $24, this is the actual bill of sale. This is the bill of sale. It is in The Hague in Holland. Uh, it was the equivalent of 60 guilders, uh, which someone figured out was worth about $24. And so you say, you're not sure the Native Americans thought they were selling it? Yeah, I don't think they were selling it because I don't think they thought anyone could sell property. First of all, it's not clear whether they thought they owned it. Uh, they didn't think they had possession of the land. They were temporary stewards of the land. They were mobile. They were migrant people. And these were the Lenape, and it's not even certain that the Lenape actually owned Manhattan Island. So while, you know... So what did they think they were getting the money for? Well, I think they thought they were getting the money for the rights for the Dutch to stay there or occupy it for a certain period of time, but certainly not in perpetuity. Uh, the Dutch 
insisted upon keeping it for all that time. Yeah. Did they not have the concept of private property? Were you suggesting that a minute ago? I think that's true. I don't think the Indians did. Uh, they were a communal society, and I don't think they did have a permanent sense of private property. Okay, that was object number five in the book, which goes more or less chronologically. Let's go right on to object number nine, because I think you all get the idea. And this is an oyster. An oyster indeed, and oysters were New York. I mean, if you are what you eat, remember Jonathan Swift said it must be a bold man who first tasted an oyster. This is, I think, the only live thing in the book. Uh, we do eat oysters live. That's one of the reasons I don't. Uh, but oysters were so um, prolific in New York. Uh, oysters were all over the place. And now, of course, we're trying to reseed the harbor, not so much as for foodstuffs as to protect against flooding. Uh, but oysters were the main staple of food in New York Harbor. This image comes from the Staten Island Museum, if I'm not mistaken. Is That's that correct? True. That is correct. Why would it be there? Any particular connection to the Staten Island uh, waters right around there? Well, they were uh, uh, grown in Staten Island. They were grown in Raritan Bay, in the Narrows, uh, but they were all over the place, and they were some a foot long. They were absolutely stupendous in size. What period of time are we this talking was, about? This uh, was the 17th, uh, 18th, up to the 19th century. All right, we've got like a dozen more items to show you. Um, what, uh, but tell people, what, what exactly is the project here? Why are we looking at photos of items from your new book, 101, New York and 101 Objects? Okay, this started from uh, the British Museum uh, and the BBC. They did a history of the world in 100 objects. And some of our viewers have seen that and will remember that series. Indeed, I did a story for the Times, and the conceit of this book was you couldn't possibly do New York in merely 100. It would take 101. So for New York, more than for the world. Yes. That's a New Yorker's point of view. Indeed it is. Indeed Wh it is. Which refers to one of the objects that I don't think we have an image of that New Yorker magazine cover? Right, the Saul Steinberg cover. Boy, what was fascinating about that, though, was I discovered, with all due respect to Saul Steinberg, that image of the inflated image of the New Yorker's view of the country goes all the way back to 1922, at least, uh, when there were images of New York, uh, this, this myopic view of uh, the rest of the country from a New Yorker's perspective. Right, and that image, if you've never seen it, that New Yorker cover, really big Manhattan, New Jersey, Chicago, San Francisco. <laughs> somewhere like China, that. all the way out there. Right. Uh, all right, let's see another one. These are burial beads found at the African burial ground in Lower Manhattan. I remember when they discovered that right near City Hall, only a couple of decades ago. That's right. That was in the 1990s. They were building a federal office building. And it is a reminder of the rich African-American culture in New York in the uh, 17th and 18th century. Uh, the burial ground was outside the city limits because African-Americans were certainly treated as second-class citizens then. Uh, and that's one of the uh, features of the book, to look at the way um, uh, New York culture uh, was uh, functioned uh, during that period. This is a 400-year history of New York. You say outside the city limits. So very early in the city's history, because we're talking about, what, 1700s? This the was last 1700s, time. and the city limits were just about where City Hall is today. And below that, that is really, really lower Manhattan by our current standards. Um, free blacks, slaves, both? both. Both indeed, uh, they worked very hard. The ones with the beads were an indication of not royalty, but people who were fairly well-to-do. And some of the other uh, skeletal remains that were found were uh, seen to be uh, uh, people who had uh, victims of very hard labor, uh, very bad working conditions. Uh, and you know, if they weren't slaves, they certainly were people who did not survive and live well to a very ripe old age. What a time, imagine when some blacks in New York were free, some were enslaved, and everybody was here in the city. Um, all right, next image. This time we're looking at a surveyor's bolt. I'm seeing this listed as, but I don't know what a surveyor's bolt well, is. Well, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, this was prescience on the part of city uh, officials back in 1811 when the northern border of the city by then was about Houston Street. And John Randall Jr. 
was a surveyor hired by the city, and he mapped the city, which again was up to Houston Street, all the way up to 155th Street. And this appears to be about the only sur surviving bolt that he put in at each intersection that he mapped all the way uptown. This one is in Central Park, uh, and uh, the city was developed on that basis all the way up to uptown. So the enemy of the preservationists. Indeed, but the uh, friend of developers, for sure. And growth in the city. Gosh, if the city ended around Houston Street, then 155th Street must have felt like the Adirondacks oh, at it, that time. Oh, indeed it was. It was the boonies by then. Um, can we see that? Um, we're, we're going to the sewing machine in just a minute, but where, where is that surveyor's bolt? It is in Central Park. You can stumble across it and stub your toe on it. Is it labeled? It is still there. There's no, it is not labeled no at all. Kidding. It is in shrubbery, and you can find it in the book, but you can't find it in the park. Wow. So who, who pointed you to it? One of the naturalists? Yes, indeed. How about that? That's a great story. Um, okay. Here's one of my favorites from the book. The sewing machine from the Harrison Ewing collection in the Library of Congress, Congress, which represents? It represents the Industrial Revolution and the garment industry in New York. It was spurred by the Civil War, making uniforms for the Union Army, before that clothes for slaves. And it was uh, indica indicative of the transformation from tailor-made clothing to off-the-rack clothing. And at one point, uh, not that long after, New York was making 40% of the men's clothing and 70% of the women's clothing in the United States, most of that made by immigrant labor and most of that immigrant labor forming the foundation of unionized labor in the United States. I don't think people can see on their television screens the imprint, but I saw it in the book. This is a Singer sewing machine. Singer sewing machine, and it says New York on it, I believe. Is it a, um, an import? Did, did, was this uh, imported to the United States, or when was the first sewing machine? It yeah. was, I think, in the 1850s, uh, and most of the manufacturing, uh, as I said, was in New York, uh, part of the garment center. Right. And it uh, was a very important part of New York, and that's why I included it in the book. And that's uh, an industry that employed so many immigrants. What percentage of the population do you remember? It was the number one employment sector in the city for a while, Absolutely. Right? It was the highest uh, manufacturing uh, employment sector for sure. All right, in the Ellis Island days. Uh, number 28 out of 101 objects. Tell me about it. This was a mock funeral for the New York Free Academy. The Free Academy was started in 1847. It really wasn't a funeral. It was really the birth of City College in 1866. It was supposed to be an uh, in education institution that provided education for the children of all the people. And indeed, it did that. Uh, it was the corner of Lexington Avenue and 23rd Street, and it became known ultimately as the poor man's Harvard University. Uh, it became a great institution in the 20th century and later became the very foundation for what is now the City University of New York. So City College, was it called City College? It then? was indeed, City College was of New York. 23rd and Lax, which is around where Baruch College That's right. is Baruch, today. Baruch, in fact, part of was a spin-off from City. Right. Uh, and this document, if it's still up, it has the word burial and the word christening in the same document. Well, it was. So is it a birth certificate or a death certificate? Well, it was a death certificate for the Free Academy I and see. a birth I certificate see. for the New <laughs> City College. Now I get it. Um, all right, let's go on to the next one. Item number 30 out of 101 from the George Grantham Bain Collection in the Library of Congress, a linotype of some sort. A linotype machine which enabled the uh, penny press to flourish in New York, uh, tabloid newspapers, regular newspapers. It enabled them to uh, expand into more than eight or 16 pages. Uh, it encouraged literacy among immigrants, among all sorts of groups, uh, and New York really became a newspaper capital, a literary capital, a publishing capital, uh, which arguably it remains today. And now new technology is putting a lot of those newspaper people out of work. But fortunately people are still reading. That's right. Uh, all right, next one, we're going to see a 
Oh, it's Sesame Street, or at least it's Big Bird. It's Big Bird, and there they are in a New York institution, a carryover from the Dutch, the stoop. Uh, a Dutch word, it was uh, originated in Holland, carried over from the Dutch, one of the traditions. And one of the things I point out in the book is that what made New York so distinct, as opposed to all the other settlements in the United States, is its Dutch roots. You can call it uh, indifference, you can call it tolerance, but it was in New York, uh, unlike the British, unlike the Swedish, the Portuguese, the French, the Spanish, it was in New York that that tolerance was exported to the rest of the country and defined New York to the rest of the world. All right, final artifact. Oh. We have this one here. Thank you, Brian. In person. People may have seen this uh, on Ronnie Eldridge's show on the same station, but the black and white cookie for us to share. This is a, uh, this is a New York uh, specific artifact. Yes, it indeed is. Uh, it's called different things in other parts of the world, an Americana in Germany. Uh, it originated apparently in upstate New York, but it is very much a New York institution. More people suggested for the book food items than anything else. And I had to draw the line somewhere, the knish, the pizza. There is a bagel in the book, of course. There is an artichoke in the book. You'll have to read the book to explain why. But the black and white cookie uh, is in the book for two reasons. One, I thought it was a symbol of coming together, as Jerry Seinfeld and Barack Obama said. And secondly, author prerogative. It's my favorite. Of course, it's not the melting pot. As David Dickens might have said, it's the great black and white cookie mosaic. And of course, side by it, side, it says a lot white. about you whether you eat the black or the white <laughs> first. I'm going to bite right into the middle here in just a second. But also, there are kind of two sorts of black and white cookies. This is the good kind. This is the really, this is the really soft, squishy, cakey kind. There are also a lot of cheap, hard black and white cookies out there these days. Aren't Absolutely, they? these are the good kind, and that's why I put them in the book. <laughs> 101 objects, New York, and 100 objects. A great coffee table or cookie table uh, item and um, so well written about by Sam Roberts, New York Times Urban Affairs correspondent who knows the city and the city's history so well. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Brian. And that's it for today. You will find us here at this time each week and tune into my daily radio show weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow morning, we remember the first official websites. The year was 1992. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.